right, now we're joined by Emerald Walker with the Yes on I-107 campaign. So go ahead with up to five minutes introduction. Great. Um, so I've, there's, a, there's been a lot of politics around this, and, and we'll get there. But first, I, I want to talk about what we're trying to accomplish and kind of the issues behind it. Um, Initiative 107 is designed to address a child care crisis in Seattle. It sounds, it sounds trite, but it's a, it's a true saying that parents can't afford to pay and teachers can't afford to stay. Um, it's not just cute, it's true. Uh, child care in Seattle is extraordinarily expensive. Full-time licensed child care uh, for an infant costs as much as in-state tuition you do. A single mom can pay up to 52% of her income on child care. That's it. So it's, it's getting outrageously expensive. So this is a big issue. Uh, parents then end up choosing between licensed care and what's, what's kind of known commonly as Craigslist care. So the lady down the street who might be OK at, at watching children, but might not be trained up in some of the best practices. So that's the reality for parents. And then the reality for teachers and assistant teachers is, is very difficult as well. Um, despite the cost of child care, kids aren't necessarily getting the best outcomes from it. Among child care centers, 38% of that workforce turns over every year. That's a really high turnover, especially when you compare it to, to public schools. So it's, turnover in the public school system is around 7%, which is high. It's not what we want it to be, but it's remarkably high in early care and learning. And they're leaving because it is it is a stressful job. It's a job that people love and enjoy, but it, it is a stressful job. The pay is very low. Um, uh, it's, it ranges from $24,000 to $29,000 a year uh, for assistant teachers to teachers. Um, and training is offered in a pretty haphazard way. So let's say that it, it, it takes 30 hours of training to become a, child, a licensed child care provider. On top of that, you've got to get um, uh, 10 hours in a year. What tends to happen, because training isn't offered in a coordinated fashion, is a teacher will say, oh shoot, I need to go get my training. And They'll get whatever training is available, not necessarily the training that builds on their experience, not necessarily the training that is in the most current best practices, and in many cases, not the training that is in the language that they speak. So this is a, this is a crisis for child care centers, it's a crisis for parents. Initiative 107 is, a, is not a silver bullet, but it's a start to a solution. It does a few things. One, it directs city council to set a long-term policy goal of reducing the cost of childcare to 10% of a family's income. This is a recognized best standard. Um, this is a goal. This isn't a mandate. This is a goal. The other thing is that it raises standards within the industry to begin to address the turnover issue. It would give early educators a bump in pay a year faster than the city's minimum wage ordinance, so it would bring people up to 15 sooner. The other thing we do is it would create a platform for, for more consistent and accessible training um, by creating the Workforce Training and Education Board. Got it? Um, that would make recommendations to city council and would also create the Professional Development Institute that would be responsible for making sure that the training standards set forth by city council are achievable within the community of caregivers. I believe I'm out of time. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I'm happy to answer more questions about it, but that's, that's the meat and potatoes of the, of the initiative. Thank you. So now we'll open up to follow-up questions. These are two-minute answers. Um, David, and then I have one. Uh, <clears throat> you've been kind enough to provide us with the cost yeah. analysis. Yeah. And um, could you give me the two-minute uh, overview of this. I'll give you a spiel on that. Yeah. Yeah. This, yeah. Um, the reason this document was created is because City Hall came out with a some information on cost that we don't we don't know how they arrived at that because we don't know how we, we've not actually seen their fiscal memo and their and their legal memo that pointed to this. Um, but they came out with an outrageous number on cost. They came out with 100. 
and they're hanging that analysis on the idea that this part three, establishing a policy that no family should pay more than 10% of their income on childcare, they're hanging their hand on that being a mandate. That is not a mandate. This is a should. This is the, this is all it mandates the government to do is sit down with stakeholders and develop goals and what, and what are achievable milestones within the first 12 months. So we, most of the cost burdens associated with Initiative 107 are administrative in nature. Um, and in addition to that, we know that it will take some resources to run this professional development institute. The extent to that cost is ultimately up to city council because the, the enhanced training requirements should be decided by city council. So if city council, for example, decides that everyone needs a master's degree, that's going to cost a lot of money. If they decide instead that people need enhanced training on how to prevent crib death, that's probably going to cost less money. So it's, it, 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 there's a continuum, and it would be up to them to decide what's achievable. So, um, my question. So, kind of picking back and off of that, the um, we heard last night a critique that while um, this seems aspirational, there's a right of private action in there somewhere mm -hmm. that potentially that may have been where this hundred million came from. Um, is there some sort of right to private action, right of private action to get injunctive relief to force something like this somewhere in the initiative and it's so I'm so, glad, I'm so glad you asked. That's a really important question. So um, any and all ballot language contains, uh, is particularly on citizens' initiative, has boilerplate language at the end of it that says, is the, it basically it says, if this is passed, it becomes law, and if the government doesn't make this happen, any citizen can sue. That's, that's, that's the way that ballot initiatives work. Um, that's boilerplate. Our, our opposition is rattling off boilerplate language that, that is at the bottom of every ballot measure. That is only for the things that are a mandate. This is not for things that say should. You'll notice that there's things that are a mandate in this initiative, but the 10% goal is not one of them. Okay, so like the so, $15 an hour would be a mandate. That's a so if somebody didn't get their, if, if they didn't get their wage increase in, in enough time, they that's could That's a mandate, see. yeah. Yeah, and then there's, there's other elements that are mandates. But it, just like any policy, what, if this is passed by voters, it, it would become the law, and then it would be up to city council to come up with, to engage in rulemaking, to make, to make that, to comply with the law, and then, just like anything, if, if a private citizen's plan is that they're not complying with the law, they need to. But that's only if it's a mandate. The 10% goal is not mandated. So much so, actually, that in there, you know, that we've been a bit of a legal conversation um, about this. In their own legal brief on this, the city didn't address the 10% issue. So they are addressing it in political venues, but not active. The attorneys are not engaging. Very this, is, this, is, this seems like my craft. Yeah, we're walking through. <laughs> Other questions? I've got, I don't want to have any questions, but I don't want to bolt the update. Um, professional Development Institute. Yes. Uh, is it uh, possible that that's going to be a for profit organization? Mm. The Professional Development Institute is. Um, Consider the, 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 real, the, the real thing that we want to point to here is the provider organization, and then the Professional Development Institute is the working function of the provider organization. Initiative 107 calls for the city to hire a provider organization that is to facilitate communication between policymakers and the workforce. And the institute would be the, the, the functional arm of that provider organization. So it, it, it could be, but largely it's a, it's a collaboration by, so it, in order to be hired as a provider organization, an organization would have to demonstrate that they have capacity to communicate with the workforce. 
It could be for profit, it could be not for profit, but that would be up to the city to uh, put out a proposal for that in the future. Yeah, I, I'm, might be a little slow here. The, when you talk about communicate with the workforce, mm -hmm. uh, um, is communicate in this case a synonym for training? Yeah, for training and, and reach. So here's an example. Laura Chandler, do you, know, do you guys know Laura Chandler? She runs um, the Small Faces Child Development Center. It's in the 36th, and she's the chief petitioner for her. I've driven past it. <laughs> she's the chief petitioner for Initiative on Center. Laura Chandler offers training. She's a trainer, she's a well known trainer. But she has no systematic way to plug in as a trainer. It's just if people know of Laura and know how to find her, they might be able to access some of her trainings. The idea is behind the Professional Development Institute is that there would be a central organization that coordinates that, where she could call them and say, hey, I offer training in X, Y, and Z. And they could say, cool. We're gonna we're we're gonna make sure that everyone knows that you do that, and we're gonna facilitate a way for people to get in touch with you. Guys. There's there's no such coordination, so it would be creating a different level of regulation. But I would argue that that's necessary in this field. So um, I know the, the initiative says you know, the city will establish or certify based on this criteria. But is the idea for this to be sort of analogous to what 775 did with the training partnership with home care workers after 1163? Uh, per perhaps. I, honestly, I'm not as familiar with that, and so I can't speak specifically to it. Um, but it would be it would be a, work, a, a training partnership in a way that that meaning that gives teachers and early learning professionals a meaningful voice in that capacity. Yeah. Um, now the, the council backed version is specifically pre-K. This your what this I-107 seems to encompass all yes. child care, which is um, babies on up. It's babies on up and it's not necessarily an educational center. We're, we're talking about licensed like you know, family home child care, child care centers, daycare That's exactly centers. right. Right. Yeah. So um, I guess I, I'm very familiar with the statewide regulations around child care through my day job with the state. How, um, so I'm familiar with like the STARS training, the 20 hours, the 10 hours, okay. all this yeah. stuff. So um, how would a city, however it's implemented, uh, how would a city, um, just a citywide additional training requirement work with Washington Administrative Code. How does the Department of Early Learning have a stance on this? Or is it just in order to operate a business within the city of Seattle and you have to meet this and the Department of Early Learning for the state wouldn't care? Honestly, I'm, I'm less familiar with how it, how it would relate jurisdictionally between city regulations and statewide regulations other than saying, I know that regulations apply as long as you're within that jurisdiction. Some of that might depend on whether or not there's a home rule charter and what and, and what applies within the within the city of Seattle. But I'd have to get back to you on that. That's okay. That's okay. Yeah. Okay. I know it's a super long people. It, 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 it is. I stumped Michael okay. Bryan, so I can stump you. You have you have that long speed. Mary. I can't do long because I don't know much about this. But what other cities have a similar plan? Are there any and? Uh, is, is it patterned after anything, or is this unique to Seattle? I believe that this is unique to Seattle. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there are some some models that this is based off, and there's a, there's a, and I can follow up with some information on that, mm -hmm. on what those are. Um, I if there's time, okay. if there's time, can I mention a couple things about? The, the differences between the initiatives, sure. or is, is that okay? Sure. sure. Okay. Yes. What, what are the differences between the initiatives? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm glad that you asked. Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk recently about these two initiatives and how they're playing now. And the truth is they're both really good for kids, and they're both good things. And we are, we are pushing for a scenario where voters can weigh in on both independently of one another rather than choose one over the other. Um, because they do different things, they're compatible. 
So the Cities Initiative is um, a preschool pilot program that reaches up to 2,000 kids in its first four years. It's a property tax levy. It is for public preschool, aimed at mostly three and four year olds, some five year olds, but it's, it's a very specific thing. This is Initiative 107 is aimed at our existing early learning and care system. There's 4,500 teachers within that system reaching kids from babies to school age. And we're talking about daycare versus preschool. These, are, these really are different things. So because they're different, they're compatible. Um, one of the main differences, though, with Initiative 107 is that it actually gives the people who do the work, a practical voice in policies that are set forth and training requirements and systems around it. So that's, that's one of the main differences. But we will know on Friday um, after the Court of Appeals around what direction we're going to take here. But I'll, I'll say that they are different. So <clears throat> I haven't studied much on this. but. Uh, the lady I work with, I work with her while I'm an engineer. Okay. And she has two kids in, in the child care. And I haven't had little kids forever. But uh, she was telling me that her two kids, it cost her $2,200, $2,250 a month yeah. for a short child care. And this is at a Boeing provided facility by on site. Um, I don't see that the, we won't pay more than 10%. You should. There would be a, it's a goal. Mm -hmm. get, what the short term effects going to be on cost of child care for people that are making decent you know, money? Is it going to be 22? Oh, so. It, it looks to me like this requirement of, of going up to $15 an hour is going to increase the child care costs. Got it. Okay. okay. Thank you. How do you address that? There, it calls on City Council to create a small business fund to to assist in the small businesses that would have a hard time implementing that. Um, so that's that's the way that it's I'm addressed. Talking small, I'm talking about big business. It would put the onus on the provider. Uh -huh. Right? So, yeah, it would. I mean, even though the, these two people have double income and, and they have two kids and they make money, but they're talking about, you know, three, two or three thousand dollars a month. That's the thing, though. Uh, the centers tend to be stuck in this way, right? They yeah. operate on shoestring budgets, and yet the only way, it, what are they going to do, pass all the costs along to parents when the cost is already kind of astronomical? Right. You know, so they're stuck, and so that's why we're trying to create a systematic solution where we're saying, here's some standards that we think should, that we think are very important, and hey, policymakers, <coughs> here's some goals that we need you to keep in mind when you're thinking about these, sta these standards. Similar to goals around, a, around like, any homelessness. You know, it's obvious that homelessness continues to exist, but it's good that we have policy goals around ending it <laughs> because it keeps it keeps the eye on the prize, and that's the idea of the council. Um, you include preschool as part of your, your proposal, and the mayor's proposal seems to have, and, and I just read something today, and I can't tell you exactly how it's tied to the price of color for. doing the hands-on work of caring for children on a day-to-day -day basis. 
to come together at the same table and come up with policies and training requirements that are functional with, and, and achievable, and then, and then go from there. So it creates a framework for the people who know to sit down with the people who do the work. So best practices to the to, to, to practical hands on. Mm -hmm. so, so it's really so it seems like the, I mean, the, and the, I guess this is an argument for important part, but it seems like the main, the focus of this initiative is completely different from the, the pre-K initiative altogether. Your focus is on like, pretty yeah. much the family home child care provider who cares for eight to 12 kids in her home, maybe in English, maybe not, funded by Working Connections Child Care from the state. Not. Do you know about this? Yes. Uh, so I guess the, the question is, to what extent does I-107 apply to preschools? Other, you know, defined as not just a family home child care center. Well, one example is that we initially want to send the to Montessori's, okay. whereas the city's pre-K proposal does not, right? So that's, it doesn't so apply. So 107 applies to any sort of pre-K child care or early learning or whatever you call it, whether like, it's yes. an actual academic pre-K certified you know, serious school. It's the early learning and care system. So it's everything from centers mm -hmm. to in-home providers. But it takes kids up to kindergarten age. So uh, include that same demographic, demographic that up to the year's plan is aiming at. Zero to five. Mm -hmm. Although it would apply to child care that handles children all the way up to 10 and 12. Yeah, it's going to do it. Really? Because oh, yeah. oh, sure. a family home I guess, yeah, I, you know, I've not actually been asked that question before because that's not what comes to mind for most folks. Mm -hmm. uh, because that would, that would more be after school care, really, right? But a lot of these, well, a lot of these. But a lot of the in home care providers. I mean, you have. Before and after, in many cases. Yeah, you know, I mean, hundreds of. Girls of yeah. But you have hundreds of these family home yeah. child cares where they have. Um, you know, two or three kids during the day, and then That's at three o'clock, eight of them show up. Let me follow up with you yeah. on that. So I'm making a note of actually who's um, so You only have to have different ratios depending on how many kids there are zero to two, and, and how many are two to four, so and I'm how many are four to twelve. Care of other cities. And I'm steeped in the I did this stuff today. Um, so this is very much in the weeds, but I, no, I. It's I mean, it's clear that, that I-107 is, is, uh, applies to a lot of entities that have absolutely nothing to do with pre-K. They're family home child cares. And it's not a pilot. Right. So, you know, the city's pre-K proposal is a pilot. It's a good pilot. It's a pilot that we should try. It's a pilot that we should try to scale up. And that's, that's the idea, is that you scale something like that up over 20 years, and that's in our proposal. These shouldn't exist in a way that you have to choose one or the other. So the, the, the training partnership and the training standards, would the standards and partnership be bifurcated or trifurcated around the type of entity that's being covered? Because if 107 does apply to like a family home child care or a child care center or a Montessori school or some other accredited preschool, um, would you have a different sort of training group or different partnership for each of those, because they do very different things. So you're asking about implementation. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about this proposal is that this is a citizen's initiative. So we can only go so far down the road on You have to be judged. Yeah. Right. And when it comes to the city's proposal, it is not a citizen's initiative. It is a proposal that's coming out of city government. So ahead of voter approval, they're able to get a little more down the road on implementation, or at least how they think they would do it. That's not the case with the Citizens Initiative. You pass a policy, and then it's up to city council and other policymakers to engage in rulemaking. So what we're asking in this scenario is, you know, for both, in, for both initiatives to be weighed by voters on their own merits, if they both pass, great. It would be up to the city council at that point to engage in rulemaking to make both policies true. And where there's overlap, they would have to address that. You know, but it, we can only go so far as the citizens initiative down the road of implementation because we're not the people who implement. We're the people who participate in it, but we're ultimately not the folks who decide. 
So we're actually over time. Do you want to take 30 seconds to close it? Um, you know, I'll say that this is this is a broadly supported proposal. It's supported by a lot of child care providers. It's supported by a lot of child care centers. It's supported by unions, uh, culturally specific communities, um, and uh, and this is a, a, this is a very this is a workforce that is eighty percent women. This is also a very diverse workforce. So this is something that this is this is a truly diverse coalition supporting this proposal. So I hope that we can go through along with everything else that's been working in Seattle. And thanks for getting into the weeds with me. And I will I, I will extract these weeds and um, send you more information as I do that. That'd be great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.